Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. So, well, okay. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about Cloud Run for Anthos. I think you've been hearing about Cloud Run and Cloud Run for Anthos throughout the day. And, you know, Vic came here, talked about um, building platforms and higher level abstractions. Then she really came here, talked about Anthos service mesh. So we're, we're, we're going to try to piece these, uh, put these pieces together and let's see if we can build something higher platform. So my name is Ahmed Altbalk, and I'm a developer advocate. I'm joined by Jay here from our San Francisco office. Uh, he's a customer engineer, and we'll be talking about Cloud Run and Cloud Run and Toast today. So as you've seen earlier today, you know, when you get into the Antos world, there are all these abstractions and components that you let you build a full-fledged infrastructure that you can freely deploy applications. But when you think of higher level abstractions, for example, your developers, I bet, they don't want to learn Kubernetes. Most of the developers, ideally should not be learning Kubernetes, right? That's why we want to build platforms. We want to build all these sort of higher level abstractions. So why don't we, so it seems like a piece of the puzzle is missing out there. And this is precisely what Cloud Run on Anthos is. But again, pretty much any developer abstraction we built, for example, in this case, Cloud Run on Anthos, it's not the end game. It takes you to some level, but maybe there is something else that you can put on top of it. And we're gonna talk about that too. So this by no means is the end game in terms of developer experience. So let's talk about serverless. I know you didn't come here to hear about serverless, did you? Um, so you might think, you know, hey, I, you know, I have on-prem stuff, maybe you know, I wanna do multi-cloud stuff, why are you telling me about serverless? And the reason for that is, serverless world has been you know, taking the internet by the storm because they have done something that is pretty remarkable. I can write my application code and I can directly deploy it without knowing anything about the infrastructure whatsoever, right? So this might be totally irrelevant to you. If you heard about, you know, Google Cloud Functions, Lambda, and these sort of things, these sort of technologies, maybe this is very different than what you've been already doing, but there is, a, there is something that we can learn from. And the fact that your developers do not care about the infrastructure anymore, and they can be productive, they can write code and go to production in a very short amount of time, I think that's pretty remarkable. So when we think about serverless, we're seeing that you know, there's an operational model that makes serverless serverless, and there's a programming model. So first of all, there is no infra management. You know, in the serverless world, they have this place, they don't touch machines anymore, they don't configure load balancers, firewalls, and you know, just because the infrastructure under them updates regularly and it's patched regularly, they just write their code and everything else, their dependencies, the OS packages and the runtimes, everything, that gets patched by the cloud provider. So there's a world like that out there. And they pay per use. For example, you get one request, you pay for one request, that's it. And similarly, they've been constructing their applications as little microservices or little functions, lambdas. And these applications are invoked through the events or requests that come to that application. So they've been writing these services and you know, I'm assuming some of you also have services that sound like that. So at the end, I think uh, we can learn something from this. So serverless, at the end of the day, is nothing more than efficient developers and efficient operators. This is what it's bringing you know, developers to these sort of platforms. If you look at it, like Google App Engine was released a decade ago. That, that's not new. I mean, we've been doing serverless for a pretty long time. And the reason people have been opting in for that model is they're pretty efficient at it. They can write their code, go to the production or staging in a minute or so. And this is precisely why I think there is something to learn from that, right? So developers care about velocity, right? They want to write their code, they want to take their code and put it into production, and they want do it, to do it in a reliable way. They want, when they ship their code, they don't want to hear from their you know, operators or you know, DevOps person or the SRE that they broke everything. So they want that reproducibility, they want that monitoring, they want you know, these pieces that makes the whole thing reliable. So this is where we introduced Cloud Run. So Cloud Run, as of last week, it's a generally available product. It's Google's serverless platform that lets you run any container image in Google's fully managed infrastructure. You give us a container image, let's say there's a web server in that image, and that's the end of the story. We run that image for you. We give you an endpoint that is fully secured, we scale it for you. You call Google, you say, I'm, I'm gonna have a Black Friday sales coming up tomorrow, or in a week or so. Can you, you know, schedule me, can you like allocate something like this to me, that is like maybe I want 5,000 containers. And then Google tells you, okay, you're good to go. And then next thing you know, Black Friday, 9 a.m., you're getting hundreds of thousands of requests, and CloudRun can effectively scale that for you. 
And we're gonna talk about how that looks like. So as I talked earlier, Cloud Run, you come with a container image that you're already familiar with, that's the price of entry. As long as you can package your application into, cloud, cloud, into a container, you can deploy it to Cloud Run. And you can run any language and framework. So this is, this is how it differs than most other serverless platforms. Because normally, when we think of functions and like app engine sort of paradigms, we're restricted to certain languages and like their versions, right? You know, normally you can run Python 2.7 and 3.2 or something. But you can't go beyond that. So Cloud Run gives you that flexibility. And it's fully managed infrastructure and you pay for you know, what you use and you get rapid auto scaling that effectively handles the traffic spikes. So you know, you're still probably thinking, this is you know, irrelevant to me, this is not quite what I do. But anyway, I'm gonna show you how Cloud Run looks like in action. Can we switch to the demo machine, please? All right. All right, so this is Google Cloud Console. You're probably familiar with that already today. So this is the Cloud Run UI. When I say create a service, the only thing that I'm asked about is, what is your container image? So I, I'm gonna type an image here. And I'm gonna talk about this image in a bit, actually. So let's actually go to the repository. So I have a repository here, publicly available on GitHub. You know, I'm randomly gonna deploy some software from GitHub. This service claims to be converting Word documents to PDF. Okay, let's see how it does that. I see a Docker file here, cool. I guess I'm gonna build a container with that. So if I go to that Python image, Python source code, source code I'm gonna see that down here, this program is actually nothing more than something that calls into LibreOffice. If you're not familiar, that's the open office, right? So this is sort of what we call legacy software, right? There is like 15 year old program that I can run in a container. So I can accept requests, I get a Word file, and then I give it to OpenOffice, I get a PDF output, and I send it back as a response to the request. So this is what the application looks like. I already built that, built that Docker file, so I'm gonna directly deploy it. I come back to the Cloud Run. It asks me, where do you wanna deploy? I wanna say, let's deploy on Cloud Run fully managed first. And then I say, allow every single request without authenticating people, because I wanna build a public application, right? Okay, so what's happening right now is Google Cloud is taking my application image, from Google Container Registry, and it's going to deploy it on a fully managed platform, and it's gonna give me a URL back. So that URL is going to be fully secured with HTTP. I can do IAM and like access controls and stuff like that if I want to. So in a few seconds here, hopefully the service is gonna come up and we're gonna see that the application is running completely managed. So at that point, I can give that URL to you know, anyone. I can run a TV ad with that because I'm not managing any infrastructure anymore. Like, I'm not in the business of managing anything re regarding the operations of this application. So here, I get this application, you know, I click to it. There's a bit of a cold start because it's the first time I deploy the application, so it's coming up. But essentially, you know, it's running this application, which is a, you know, PDF converter. I think I'm running into internet issues here. Anyway, we're gonna come back to that later, maybe. Yeah, that doesn't seem to be loading right now. I think this is internet conference Wi-Fi failing us. Okay, let's go back to the slides now. We're gonna come back to that later. All right, can we go back to the slides, please? Slides, please. <laughs> Slide latency. You know what? Until the slides come up, I'm gonna click on this once more. Nah, it's okay. I think the Wi-Fi is failing me pretty well right now. All right, let's go back to the slides, please. <laughs> All right, yeah. So, essentially, what I just did there is, I deployed a legacy application because I was able to put it in a container, right? And then I was able to give it to Google so that it can run it in a fully managed environment that is with rapid auto scaling and scale to zero. And then at the end, I got this HTTPS endpoint that was fully managed by Google. So what if you want these functionality in your Kubernetes cluster? So this is precisely where Cloud Run on Anthos comes into picture. So we want to give you the choice of where you want to have this developer experience. Because as a developer, you know, I can just build a container image and go to, the full, full, go to a pretty well managed environment that already does a lot of, simplifies a lot of the operations for me, right? So this is where Cloud for Anthos comes into the picture. It's the same experience that you get on a serverless platform. It runs in your GK Kubernetes cluster next to your Kubernetes workloads. 
So this is still Kubernetes. You're still running a Kubernetes cluster, but you give your developers a higher level abstraction. And if you want to customize all the auto scaling and how does the load balancing work, you know, th this is pretty customizable, and I'm gonna touch on that shortly. So, you know, your developers might be, you know, maybe they want a UI. So, you know, this is what I did. I used the UI. I could have used the CLI as well. If you're into infrastructure as code, for example, in the previous talk, you've seen Vic and his friends demo a, um, an application uh, that is purely deployed from a YAML file. So if I want that, I can still go that route. I can write a YAML file and I can deploy that. And under the covers, the way Cloud Run and Cloud Run on Anthos work the same way is because they both use this thing called Knative API. And Knative is that open technology that let, makes this possible to run your applications either on Google's fully managed platform or in your clusters, either on cloud or on-prem or maybe another cloud provider. So Knative is that open source API and the implementation that codifies these practices of running microservices or serverless applications on Kubernetes. It's an open API. It is jointly developed by Google, Red Hat, IBM, and a few others. So, by adding Knative, which is, in this case, managed by Cloud Runner and Anthos to my cluster, I'm able to run stateless applications more effectively. I can go somewhere, I can click a button, and then that application is pretty much ma managed and auto-scaled for me at that point. Like, I don't have to worry about, you know, configuring horizontal pod auto-scalers, memory-based scaling, and these sort of things anymore. So, in terms of auto-scaling, if you look at Kubernetes, so that you're probably writing all these like horizontal pod auto-scaler configurations that are memory and CPU-based, so actually something needs to happen. Like, for example, your CPU utilization needs to hit 70, 80%, and then at that point, you're going to get auto-scaling happen, right? But by then, it might be too late. So in Knative case, we're doing rapid request-based auto-scaling. Anytime a request comes, that's an input to the auto-scaling machine. So if I get suddenly 100 requests and I can't handle 100 requests, that actually means that I need to hold on to those requests and add more pods so that I can send the traffic to. And another thing is scale to zero. Maybe you don't care about this, but actually if your application is not running, this gives you a greater ability to put, fit more applications into one cluster. If an application does not get any requests, it's not running. Next time it gets, gets the request, we wake up the application, but at the same time, we hold on to that request. We don't drop the request. So this is not available in Kubernetes, and this is what you get with Knative. And similarly, normally in Kubernetes, you have the connection-based, like TCP-based auto load balancing, right? I'm sure if you're using this in production, you probably realize that's not the best way to do load balancing. And in Knative case, we do per request load balancing and traffic splitting, so this lets you do uh, canary rollouts or blue-green deployments, right? And this is all possible because in, in an Anthos cluster, there is Anthos service mesh providing load, for, providing load balancing capabilities and, and stack driver support that lets you monitor your applications. So now we're gonna go back to the demo machine again and let's try to cloud run on Anthos and how different could it actually be, all right? So I think I'm going to turn off my Wi-Fi. Uh, I'm hoping I'm connected over the wire right now. Um, let's try this, all right. It was a previous application that I was trying to connect to. I don't know why it's still not working. Uh, but let's go ahead and deploy the same application uh, in a cloud run on an, on an Anthos cluster this time. So I go here and I type the image name again. Yep. And then this time, I'm gonna say, let's choose a Cloud Run on Anthos cluster. And in my project, it turns out there's a GK cluster available. I choose that. And then I say, let anyone connect to this application. Then I go ahead and create the application. So again, the same thing. I, I use the same developer experience. As a developer, this is what I see. I have an application. I have maybe like a memory CPU setting, but at the end of the day, I just wanna deploy it. And in a few seconds, I get a URL back. I click on it. So this was the application that you were supposed to see in the first place. Um, you know, as you can see here, I'm able to deploy the same application to Cloud Run on Anthos. But I told you earlier, this is still Kubernetes, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So here, I'm going to bring up my Cloud Shell. If you don't know that, that's a pretty cool feature we have. Um, so so let, let's take a look at my Kubernetes cluster. Let's, take a, let's try to understand what's going on here. And I have a, as you can see, I have a three node GK cluster here. And what I just deployed was actually a Kubernetes object. So if I, for example, if I close this down here, if I look at the YAML, well, this looks a lot like Kubernetes, right? This is, you know, all these 
specs and containers, resources, memory limits. Okay, so now let's try to actually make sense of this. So here, I'm going to ask for, a ser ask for an API type called QCL get K service. So K service is the K native service abstraction. It's not greatly named because there's already a Kubernetes service object. But hold on for a moment. All right. So it seems like I already have the PDF application I deployed in the cluster running, right? So I see the service here. If I do the kubectl get SVC, which is the normal Kubernetes service, I can see that there's already a service created for that PDF application here. And essentially, it's making the application that I just deployed available within my cluster. So if someone else wants to call this application within the same cluster, they can do that. Maybe I can limit connectivity to only the cluster. I can say, don't allow anyone externally calling this application. I can have a completely private microservice deployed this way, right? So, for example, let's, let's take a look at the pods, what's running in this cluster. So you're gonna see that there is a pod running, but it's actually going away, it's terminating. And the reason it's terminating is because I didn't send it any requests for the past 30 seconds or so, right? So if I go back and refresh, so right now, a new container is coming up, it came up, and it served the application. So if I go back and run kubectl get pods again, as you can see here, there's a new pod running, and those, those just started like eight seconds ago, right? So this is sort of how Knator works. All right, let's go back to the slides, please. Can we go back to the slides, please? <laughs> All right. So this is Cloud Runner and Tosin in a nutshell, right? So wh what I just did was, you know, I had the same developer experience. I went from the UI, which just told me, hey, choose your container image. I specified my container image, just like I'm doing serverless stuff. But I was able to get this in my Kubernetes cluster. So we saw how Knative works under the covers. It's still Kubernetes objects. Your developer, op your DevOps uh, people and your administrators and operations people can go and configure these objects further. You can impose Kubernetes policies on them. You can use Anthos config management to spread these objects or apply policies that would limit access to these objects, right? So because this is still Kubernetes. And um, I wanna actually uh, go back to the demo machine momentarily because I forgot to show the traffic splitting. So let's actually see that too. You know, I just deployed this another application here. Um, it is called Hello App, right? Uh, so this is running a similar, uh, similar application image. If I click on that, that's gonna come up shortly. You know, as you can see, this is a Hello World 1.0. Um, you know, as a developer, I can say, hey, deploy a new revision. For example, I get 2.0, and then I say, let's go ahead and deploy this. And while deploying, or after I deploy this application, I can actually say, let's manage the traffic. For example, I want, I want to send 50% of the traffic to V2, so I go ahead and save this. You know, again, this is possible because we're using Antho Service Mesh under the covers. We get that load balancer with Istio. We get the same load balancing capabilities that you would normally get in an Anthos cluster, right? So I go back to the application. Now, every time I refresh, I'm either gonna get V1 or V2, right? So I'm refreshing one, 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 two. So that's pretty much how traffic splitting works. If I were to set this to a value like five or 10%, I will be able to do canary rollout or blue-green deployments. So this is pretty much how traffic splitting works uh, in a nutshell. Let's go back to the slides, please. Yeah, and finally, this is still Kubernetes. Like, we're not adding new complexity. This is a software-based stack. I did load balancing with software. I deployed a new application, configured a new application with software. I didn't involve any sort of hardware in this, right? I, I was able to use what's already in your cluster, which is the Anto service mesh setup. If I wanna get metrics out of this application, this is still possible. So now, let's briefly talk about mig migrating your applications to Cloud Run. So what, what, what sort of applications actually fit into Cloud Run, right? So first of all, your application needs to be stateless. A lot of services are, turns out, stateless. Yes, there are stateful services as well, but if you have microservices, front-ends, you know, anything that handles events or processing queues, these sort of applications, actually, you know, they're fault tolerant. You, you can kill them or you can scale them up and they usually pick up the load and they continue where they left off or something like that that helps you build applications that are resilient. So if you have an application, you can make it work on an HTTP or gRPC port you can run it on Cloud Run. And ideally, if it's not an application that takes 10 minutes to start, as you see here, every time I get a new request, 
I start a new instance of that. And that instance stays away, stays around so that I can send more requests to it, right? But additionally, you can configure the Knative autoscaler. I can go and say, hey, you know what? I don't want cold starts. So that's one, that's the biggest problem with serverless, right? People say, there's cold starts. I, want, I don't want cold starts. In that case, you can say, please scale my, my application to maybe minimum one. Instead of going to zero, you can say, I don't want zero. I want to keep it one. So you can have that on Cloud Run. So here I have the usual Kubernetes deployment and service file. You know, they're, you know, they say, hey, I have this application. Here's the image. Here's the CPU requirements. And then to make this application accessible internally in my cluster, I define a service. So let's go through this and see if there are like commonalities that we can read out. For example, replicas one. I don't need replicas one because with Cloud Run or Anthos, I'm getting out of scaling out of the box. I don't need to worry about how many replicas are running, are running right? And there are all these labels. I don't know if anyone here actually goes and configures like labels on their deployments so they can choose them and have them overlapping labels and stuff like that. So that doesn't happen very often. And similarly, on the service side, there are all these labels and I'm, you know, trying to do the selector because I need to go back to the deployment and match to the pods deployed by the deployment. And you know, I'm still in the business of doing port numbers. This is pretty interesting. Like with Cloud Run on Anthos, you don't have to do port numbers anymore. The port number is given to you and you can customize that. So there's that. So why don't we get rid of the service object altogether and take the good parts of the deployment? So that gives us the new Knative service object. As you can see here, it's pretty brief. It only has a few lines. I can just specify my deployment spec, which contains the only critical information about my container. What is my image? What are my resources? If you need to add labels, you can still go and do that, but you don't have to. So compared to the deployment object, I think we've come a long way. Like, as you can see, pretty much what I just changed was I changed the API group, and I took the parts that mattered into the new object, and now I'm actually running on Knative, which is Cloud Runner Anthos. So here, I'm gonna transfer to Jay, and he's gonna talk to you about eventing, which is a critical part in serverless developer experience. All right. Thank you. I want to create a data-driven organization. Has anybody heard that before? Maybe in the field, maybe their manager has said that at some point in time. Who here has heard something about data-driven organizations? All right, does that, does that actually mean anything? Like, it's, it, it, it really, it, it sounds like one of those buzz terms, you know? Oh, we're, we're data-driven, we collect a lot of data, we like data. But what are we doing with the data? Are we just storing it in some warehouse in a, the Nevada desert? Is it, actually be, is it actually being used for something? My theory is that when people say they want a data-driven organization, what they actually mean is they want an event-driven organization. They don't want to just get arbitrary data coming into their application. They actually want to know that something is happening out there in the world that their application needs to respond to. Maybe you have a ride share app and somebody has just ordered a ride or maybe there's a traffic and you want to be able to update the estimated time of arrival. You want to, th this data needs to serve a purpose so when we start framing data as events, then it starts to serve a, more, a better purpose for our application, something we can actually build a solution towards. And in fact, if you saw one of the earlier slides when we were talking about serverless, one of the six, I guess you could say, segments of serverless was event-driven. And uh, how do we do that? Well, Knative actually has a component called eventing. So Cloud Run is based on Knative serving. Knative eventing is another component that makes up this whole Knative suite, if you will. Eventing is, well, it's, it allows you to uh, declaratively bind between event producers and deployed services. So now you're able to just create a, a producer or a source that creates the events, that collects the events, and then just deploy services that read said source. You can scale from a few events. Maybe you do an uh, update on your inventory at the end of the day, or maybe you want to do a live stream. And then you can create custom event pipelines to connect with your own existing systems. So perhaps you have some kind of Kafka cluster out there, something we're gonna talk about very soon. 
So Knative Eventing allows you to do all this. This is actually pretty important because you might be saying, well, what happens in that earlier, that earlier setup when we deployed? I mean, it gave us the URL. Why don't I just, you know, kind of turn on the fire hose and send all of my data to that endpoint? I mean, that'll work, right? I mean, maybe. Uh, you can actually do a lot of things with Knative Eventing. Here you have a source which can be you know, your container, it could be a GitHub, maybe something changed in GitHub, it can be your Kafka cluster, it can be something in Kubernetes itself, and it can just go ahead and deploy to your service, which is fine, but what happens when you want to fan out? What happens when you want certain services to go to receive certain events? What if you want to define events? You can't really do that as easily when you're just doing the straight HTTP. And then of course, how do you guarantee the events are sent if you're doing it that way? So what Knative will allow you to do is do a more complex, or Knative eventing rather, will allow you to do a more complex serving of your events rather than just turning on the fire hose, so to speak, onto a HTTP, HTTPS, HTTPS endpoint. An easier way to look at it, and what I'm gonna be showing you, is we have this Kafka cluster out here. We have a Knative source. Knative source, that is essentially Think of it as kind of a bucket, if you will, where all the events go to, and that serves as the source of all truth for uh, the events that come in. Then the broker is kind of a, another abstraction layer that you can then push the events to the app, so the source just collects the information. Broker kind of gives it a little more intelligent than the app or service is what actually functions there, and it uses the event to do whatever. Simple idea in terms of the real world is, you know, we have our user here, they have a mobile phone, they want to order a pizza with their app. We use Confluent Cloud, and Confluent is actually founded by the creators of Kafka, and they actually have a fully managed uh, solution that you can host on GCP. To, so you get open source Kafka, the, all the benefits of open source Kafka, plus an SLA and support, so if you're an enterprise, wouldn't it be nice to have somebody else worry about your Kafka versus your developers? And then of course, while we're talking about that, you have the Knative, so let's go ahead and look at our demo. I actually recorded it because I wish I had the confidence to do a live demo. But you know, internet Wi-Fi is what it is, but hey or uh, hotel Wi-Fi. Before we start playing the video, just gonna explain a little bit about what you will see. I created a, oh, there it is, but it's small. <laughs> anyway, so what you will see is I created a small little app. All it does is it pings Alpha Vantage. Alpha Vantage is an API tool that essentially will give you different financial data, so stock markets, currency exchange, all of that, you get like 500 free calls a day, so hey, it's perfect if you're doing a demo. It will check and then it will send the results to, to a Kafka cluster and then we will show you my Knative eventing. Uh, can we restart that real quick? So then we'll, wish I could stop myself from clicking. So I'm in the Kafka cluster, I'm in my Kubernetes cluster rather. This all has Knative eventing and Cloud Run installed. Here's my service, look, there's Cloud Run. There's Currency App, that's the application I deployed on Cloud Run. All right, now we are looking, oh, there's the API, there's what the uh, URL is, that's my cluster I showed you earlier. So I'm gonna go ahead and take that URL and go to, uh, go to Postman and start sending some API calls. Now, this is my endpoint. Basically, it takes two currencies, USD and, and Japanese yen. Now, because of hotel Wi-Fi when I was recording it, this took a little while. <laughs> but what it's gonna be doing is it's gonna be comparing and giving you the exchange rate. It will show you what the exchange rate is there. And there you go. So remember that number. Now we're gonna to go to you, we're gonna go, and this is actually consuming my Kafka cluster, so it, Kafka got that number. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and get all the pods that are running in that namespace that I created. Event display is kind of a bucket, if you will, or, or that displays all the logs that have been sent to the broker. 
We're gonna go ahead and look at the logs. So cubed CTO, we're gonna go ahead and look at those logs and see what we can find. Now this is using a format called Cloud Events, which is an open source CNCF built, uh, I guess, uh, format that for sending events. So we're keeping everything open source. It stores the data in base64. So let's go ahead and decode it. And hey, look at that, it matches. So in pretty much real time, I was able to send that event to my Kubernetes cluster. So let's go ahead and wrap this up. Why Cloud Run on Anthos? Well, easier deployment and operations for microservices. I read a study, I can't remember where, but it said like around 25, 30% of all the, uh, of, of your developer's time is actually used doing non-developer work. So, you know, we hear the term full stack developer a lot. So that usually means I'm gonna have to write YAML. I'm gonna have to manage nodes. I'm gonna have to set up databases. We make it easier for you to use microservices by abstracting away a lot of that operator work for the developers to deploy and then also make it easier for the operators to work on the stuff they need to work on and not necessarily need to be a part of the deployment process when an application version needs to be deployed. Because of that, you have increased productivity and velocity. Hey, those developers get that 25, 30% of their time back to actually develop applications. And of course, by then the story is that it enables your developers and operators to be more successful and focus on the things that matter. And thank you, and here's how you get Cloud Run, and all of our code is in these repos, and get some tips, and yeah, thank you for the time.